Okay, yes, good, alhamdulillah. So the audio is okay. Um, I welcome you all to the session today for the Active Learning Webinar, which is organized by the College of Pharmacy in collaboration with the e-learning deanship. So I'd like to introduce our speaker today, our honorable speaker today, Dr. Mona al Manasif. Uh, she has undertook her first degree in pharmaceutical science at King Saud University. And she has completed her master's degrees in clinical pharmacy in 2012 and followed by she did her uh, PhD in pharmacy practice and policy in January 2018. Actually her doctoral research uh, looked at uh, feasibility, acceptance and effectiveness of the flipped classroom and instructional model on the MPharm students in two pharmacy schools in the UK. And also Dr. Mona is an associate fellow of the Higher Education Academy in the UK. Her research interest is, includes in pharmacy education and active learning methods. And coming to uh, today's uh, topic for active learning, um, we are familiar with those uh, terminologies. We have used, we have the uh, consecutive meetings which we have conducted by our the Dean, Dr. Abdurrahman, and Dr. Magasla and uh, other colleagues. We have had a consecutive meetings. The traditional lectures are, it is just the usual, um, what you are going to do, what you are practicing at present in the colleges and in the university level. The conventional teaching approach, it's having some hindrance, the students actively participating in the learning process. That's why the recent evidences indicates that the vast majority of colleges graduates lack a fundamental proficiency such as critical thinking and complex uh, reasoning and writing communication skills. So that's why we thought engaging the students in class through active learning approaches is linked to improve the student performance motivation. So this webinar will cover a brief introduction on teaching and learning higher education. So then it will move on the presenting and overview active learning in today's topic. In addition, it will give us example of an active learning strategies that could incorporate into our lectures and how we are going to use it in the pharmacy practice for our students and as today's topic i think it is much more important and uh, for us because we are going to introduce a new curriculum for our students and we are going to introduce the new teaching approaches for our students while writing our course specifications so i think uh, it's somewhat important topic today i welcome dr ramona on behalf of our dean and our faculty members from king college university and on behalf of the e learning deanship i welcome you to the speech and the dice is yours. Dr. Mona, you can continue, please. Thank you, Dr. Noah. Um, um, hello, everyone. It's my privilege to deliver this active learning webinar today. And firstly, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the College of Pharmacy at King Khalid University for giving me the opportunity to deliver this webinar. So, So in this webinar, I will start with a brief introduction about teaching and learning in higher education. In this introduction, um, I will cover how to design effective learning. Then I will introduce um, a couple of um, useful tools that can, be, that, that can be used to assist you in designing your teaching and also facilitating student learning. In the second part of this webinar, I will give you an overview of active learning strategies and I will provide some examples of active learning strategies that could be incorporated into lectures or those that could be um, implemented as uh, independent classes. So in the final part of this webinar, I will introduce the flipped classroom teaching approach. I will pr provide some practical, practical recommendations for its um, implementations. Okay, so let's start with um, our first part, the introduction to teaching and learning in higher education. Teaching and learning in higher education is a mutual responsibility between student and teacher, and their contribution to this process is essential to its success. Higher education is expected to engage students in reflecting on their own learning, and questioning their concepts of how the world functions so students' understanding can expand to a higher level. So the issue here is that 
students are not always prepared for this challenge and not all of them have the aspiration to understand and apply knowledge. So, however, all the students aim to survive the course or learn with the desire to achieve the highest grades. <coughs> High quality teaching motivates students to learn and assist them to question their previous concepts. So learners to need to, need to be engaged with problems that they per perceive important for them. So. <laughs> So, so learners need to be engaged with problems that they perceive important for them, which promote participation um, instead of only focusing on surviving exams. The traditional lecture-based method of teaching has been predominant in university classrooms worldwide. This traditional method of teaching prevents inexperienced students from actively participating in the learning process. In this method, the, lecture, the lecturer uses the class time to transmit knowledge and facts. And what does the students do? They usually take notes about the presented lecture, which need to be reviewed later and uh, memorized for exams. In university classrooms, students are not the same. The academic orientation and commitment of students is a major source of, uh, of diversity in university classrooms. So let's, let's compare between two major categories of students. Yeah, someone's saying there is a cracking sound. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. So uh, let's compare between two major categories of students. We have the academically committed students who, normally, who are normally interested in their studies and have clear academic or career plans. And what they learn is important to them. So they spontaneously use a deep approach to learning, even if the traditional lecture is used as a method of teaching. In comparison, we have the less academic students who are mainly motivated in obtaining a qualification for a decent job. Traditional lectures commonly allow them to use a surface approach to learning, focusing on note taking and memorizing, which is usually below the cognitive level required for achieving the intended learning outcomes. So why active learning is important? In the, published, in the published research, there is an agreement that the attention span of students drops significantly after the first 10 minutes of a lecture, and the students can keep their attention for a maximum of 15 to 20 minutes. However, students' attention, attention returns at the end of the lecture, but students can only remember 20% of the content delivered in the class don't you think that's a waste of students' time? Don't you think that's a waste of resources? So, so in addition, the traditional lecture is limited by the fact that students receive information passively and are not actively engaged throughout the learning process. The starting point for designing any teaching session or a module or a program is asking yourself, what do I want my students to be able to do by the end of this teaching session or by the end of this module or program? So this is called the intended learning outcomes. So the focus here is on the learner. Intended learning outcomes are statements of what students should, should know or be able to do at the end of, let's say, a module or at the end of um, a teaching session. So this is also what you assess in your, um, in your exams or let's say assessment. You assess the intended learning outcomes. When we compare those intended learning outcomes to objectives, objectives are 
statements of what you are going to teach. So if, you, if, your, if your courses are designed by using objectives and focusing on what you have to teach, I would, so I would strongly recommend that you shift that practice and, and focus on the, on the learner and start using the intended learning outcomes. So at the beginning of each teaching session, make sure you have a list of intended learning outcomes so students are clear of what they, what they have to do, what, what do they have to achieve by the end of this course or module or teaching session. Okay, so um, let me give you an example of an objective and an intended learning outcome. So when we say uh, an example of objective, an objective is, let's say, to discuss the management of pain and treatment of acute flares in rheumatoid arthritis. So this is what you will teach. So this is um, an objective. An example of intended learning outcomes could be, um, so I would like the students, for example, to be able to recommend like an, an acute initial management for a patient presenting with chest pain. So this is intended learning out outcome. So this is really specific, what you need your students to achieve. So um, another important point to consider is to align the intended learning outcomes of a course, the teaching and learning activities, and the assessment tasks. Okay, so let me give you an example. So if, if the intended learning outcomes of um, a particular course require students to demonstrate around, let's say, a range of pharmacy-related skills and knowledge, the traditional lecture is not enough to help students to build their competence. So you need to use other, other teaching methods such as simulation workshops, for example, when you, when you allow students to practice and build their skills. So, so similarly, multiple choice questions are not enough to assess a student's achievement of these intended learning outcomes so the multiple choice questions can't assess achievement of skills. So, um, so you need, in that case, you need um, other assessment tools uh, such as OSCEs, which are, which are the oral practical examinations for uh, students in healthcare disciplines. Okay, now let's move um, our attention to the learning taxonomies. Learning taxonomies are typically used to describe different levels of learning behaviors. They are often used to define and distinguish different levels of learning development. They are useful tools in guiding the development of course curriculum, teaching methods, and assessment. There are two well-known learning taxonomies, Bloom's and the Solo. Bloom's taxonomy classifies cognitive skills into six categories, ranging from um, lower order skills that involve less cognitive processing, such as memorizing and understanding, to higher order skills that require deeper learning and a greater level of cognitive processing, such as um, analyzing and evaluating. So this slide um, shows the six levels of Bloom's taxonomy. The first level is remembering, then understanding, then applying. Those are the lower levels. Then we have the higher levels, analyzing, then evaluating, and finally creating at, at the top of the hierarchy. Okay, so Let's think, let's think back when I discuss the intended learning outcomes. 
I mentioned that they are statements of what a student should know or be able to do. So in, in writing intended learning outcomes, we use different verbs determined by, determined by what level of cognitive skills we would like our students to master or achieve. So, um, okay, let me give you an example here. So, when we start with remembering, I would like, for example, as an intended learning outcome, I would like the students to be able to describe acute coronary symptoms. So, this is an example of, like, um, rem remembering the first level of Bloom's taxonomy. So, when we go um, one level, further, which is analyzing. So an example would be, okay, I would like the students to be able to, distinct, to distinguish between ST elevation myocardial infarction and non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, for example. Going further up to creating, which is the final level of Bloom's taxonomy, um, an example would be I would like the students to be, to be able to create or develop a pharmaceutical care plan for a patient who, like, for example, underwent a coronary artery bypass graft surgery after non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. So as you can see here, uh, there is an increase in the complexity of the tasks in the examples I provided. The solo taxonomy is another is the solo is another learning taxonomy and it stands for the structure of the observed learning outcome. So the solo describe levels of increasing complexity in a student's understanding when mastering academic tasks. In the solo the structure of observed learning outcomes is presented in five levels, ranging on the basis of the structure, structural organization of the knowledge in question from incompetence to expertise. As you can see here in this table, these levels are pre-structural, unistructural, multi-structural, relational, and um, extended abstract. Most of the learning is quantitative in the early stages of solo with an increase in the amount of detail. In the subsequent stages, the learning becomes qualitative as details are integrated into a, struct a structured pattern. So, so the aim of the qualitative dimension in solo is an increase in knowledge gain, whereas the qualitative dimension aims for a deeper understanding. Okay, so you might be wondering, uh, what's the difference between Bloom's and Solo? So um, from a practical point of view, Bloom's is commonly used more by teachers than by students. So to determine the educational outcomes or the intended learning outcomes, and also to design assessment and teaching strategies. Solo can be used by both students and teacher so students can use it for self-reflection and um, assessing their learning and understanding. Um, similarly, teachers can use the solo taxonomy to assess a student's work in terms of its quality. For example, based on the solo, you can tell a student that you have used several ideas, but you have not made connections between them to make an argument. So this is a useful um, application of SOLO. Okay, so here there is another useful, useful tool that can guide choosing assessment strategies that are used to evaluate the achievement of the intended learning outcomes. This is called Miller's Pyramid or, or Miller's Triangle of Clinical Competence and Performance.
Miller's triangle has four hierarchical levels. The first level knows. It represents the knowledge that might be applied in, let's say, the pharmacist's future career to demonstrate competence. Example of assessment methods that could be used to assess this level include assays and MCQs. So the second level of Miller's triangle is knows how. It represents context-based tests that require the use of both knowledge and skills. The next hierarchical level shows how OSCEs is an example of assessment methods that can be used to assess this level. For those of, those of you who are not familiar with OSCEs, OSCEs are um, like practical examinations that can be used to assess both knowledge and um, skills, especially in, in healthcare disciplines like medicine and pharmacy. So then we have the top level of Miller's hierarchy does it corresponds with assessment methods that allow examining student performance like in in a complex and everyday situation for example an example of this um, of assessment methods that could be used to assess this level is like observe, observing trainees Okay, okay, now let's move on to the second part of this webinar, um, introduction to active learning and uh, examples of active learning strategies. Active learning is defined as the process of having students engaging in some activity that, that forces them to reflect upon ideas and how they are using these ideas. The evidence suggests that engaging students in a class through active learning approaches is, link, is linked to improved student performance, motivation and attitude. Additionally, it improves higher order thinking, critical analysis and problem, problem solving skills. Active learning methods range on the continuum from simple tasks that can be incorporated into like traditional lectures to complex tasks that, that are of longer duration and might require the whole class period or even longer, such as problem-based learning. We will go through the examples of active learning methods um, in a minute. Okay, so um, after you decide to include active learning strategies um, in, in a particular class or in a particular course, it is important to, to, to decide where these activities fit on the active learning continuum. So there are three elements that need to be considered when choosing active learning strategies. So, sorry, I, I was checking chats. Um, so these are, these are the course objectives or intended learning outcomes, your personal style or level of control, and also student experience. I will discuss each point in detail in a minute. Okay, so, Regarding course objectives or intended learning outcomes, this diagram might be helpful. We call it the course objectives continuum. It has two different or opposing ends. So we have the end that goes towards acquisition of knowledge and the other end that goes towards acquisition of skills and attitudes. So you need to ask yourself, what I would like my students to know, what I would like them to, to be able to do, what I would like them to feel. 
So it's really important to be specific with the intended learning outcomes. Okay, so moving on to the level of interaction in a classroom, this is another useful continuum with two opposing ends, the one that goes toward limited interaction and the other end that goes towards ex extensive interaction. So interaction refers to the level of interplay between, between the instructor and students, and also the level of interplay between students themselves. So you need to ask yourself where on the interaction in a classroom continuum you prefer to be. So is it toward the limited interaction or in the middle or towards the, the extensive interaction? This really depends on, on many factors. For example, your personal characteristics, your preference for a particular teaching method and your comfort and, and with the levels of control and also um, and your willingness to take risks. Finally, we have levels of student experience continuum. It has two opposing ends again, the one that goes towards inexperienced students and the other end that goes towards experienced students. So we need to ask ourselves again, where on the continuum the students are? So this will determine the level of structure that you will, that you will make for, for the in active learning class and also the level of support that you will give to students. So is, it, is this an, introduc an introductory subject and students are not familiar with the non-traditional teaching strategies? So are they inexperienced then? Or is it like, like the the therapeutics that you are teaching to the final year who final year like let's say pharmacy students who experience some active learning methods so then you would consider your your students as experienced okay so uh, let me give you some examples so if, if your course objectives focus primarily on attaining knowledge, for example, if you are teaching pharmacology one and the students in this course are fairly inexperienced with the material. So this is the first pharmacology course that they are studying and the students never been exposed to non-traditional teaching methods. So the lecture has been used as um, the main approach for teaching in their course. So then in that case, I would prefer, and then you would prefer more control and less interaction in the class. So you will, you will definitely use um, and choose learning activities that fall more towards the simple tasks, towards the left. Another example, like let's say, if you are teaching therapeutics for, to final year pharmacy students. And the objectives for the course um, are like development of clinical skills. And let's say you are comfortable with high level of classroom interaction. So you want students to interact with themselves and also you want interaction between yourself and the students. So in that case, you will choose activities um, closer to the complex tasks and of the active learning continuum. Okay, um, in this section, I will provide some examples of active learning strategies that could be incorporated into the lecture, or we call them simple tasks, or those that could be implemented as independent classes. So th those that are more like complex tasks. Muddy's point is, 
is really straightforward strategy that can be used in, in lectures, in traditional lectures. This strategy allows students to reflect on which aspect of the lecture is least clear to them. So in this strategy, you can ask students to write down what seemed most co confusing to them. And then you can, you can I think you can use um, post-it notes and flip charts. So when you get student feedback, you can look at student feedback and see, um, um, and, and see and discuss the points that many students found unclear. Madhya's point strategy is used to fill any gap in students' understanding. Um, in this strategy, um, I would encourage you to be, I would encourage you to advise students to be very specific in identifying the source of confusion. And also you can use um, this feedback to start the, the next class. So you can um, use the student's feedback to start your next session um, and clar clarify any um, misconceptions or any gap in students' understanding. Also, it's advisable to encourage students to answer each other muddiest points. So th this is just to uh, create to generate discussion between students and it's not like one-way dialogue it's not like um, interaction between the student and the teacher and also it creates discussion between students themselves another simple strategy here is the one minute paper and this is strategy um, you could enable students to explore ideas before a discussion or bring closure to a session. How can we use it? Uh, we ask students to write for one to five minutes on a topic or in response to a question that is developed for the class period. So it's um, it will allow you like to get an indication of student prior knowledge, let's say, or their um, understanding of, 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 of the presented topic. Here is another strategy called 10 to strategy. This strategy involves presenting information for 10 minutes and then stopping for two minutes to encourage students to pair up with a partner and share their ideas. So like, let's say you are giving students like half an hour lecture. How, how can you use this strategy? So basically you present your content in 10 minutes, then you stop for two minutes and ask students to like each student's work with, with a peer, like someone sitting next to them and, um, and share ideas. So this activity can, can, can be also used when students are watching um, classmates presenting. Actually, it helps the students to maintain their focus, their focus so an instructor can assess a student's understanding and also it promotes peer learning. So in this strategy, you might also encourage pairs to share their ideas with the whole class. I think this is really good strategy for maintaining focus because I don't know if you have noticed that, especially in a student's presentations, um, the presenter, the presenter would present the information that you can't be 100% sure that the audience are listening. So this is really effective strategy for maintaining focus. Here is another strategy called think, pair, share. So this is more complex than the strategies I mentioned before. 
So it could be incorporated into the traditional lecture. So just like you can use it for, let's say, 10 minutes, just to introduce some elements of interactivity in the traditional lecture, because if the traditional lecture is just presenting, student will be sitting there passively, maybe listening, maybe not listening. So introducing some elements of interaction is important. So think, pair, share involves asking students a particular question. For example, what is the, what is the initial acute management for, of, of a patient presenting with chest pain? And then you allow students to reflect on this question individually, let's say for three minutes. And then you ask students to pair up with someone sitting next to them and share responses and thoughts. And they do that verbally and then come with a consensus and agreement. So then the instructor can randomly choose a few pairs to summarize their ideas to the whole group. This is really effective um, strategy. And it could be also used in large classroom setting. Like when you have hundreds of students, you can ask, um, like if you have like hundreds of students in a class and ask them to pair, you will have like 50 pairs of students. So another strategy is simulations. Um, in simulations, a person or a system or a computer program um, demonstrates an action or a symptom or a scenario. So students are expected to respond. Okay, so uh, let me give you an example of simulation. Um, for example, you have like in, in a therapeutic class, you get two pharmacy students paired together. One student role play the patient and the other student role play the pharmacist. So the pharmacist has to counsel the patient on a prescribed medicine, for example, methotrexate, and it would be benefi beneficial to bring actual medicine with a leaflet. So it's, it mimics real life, it's simulation. So then the student who, who is playing the pharmacist is given feedback by the whole group and also by the, by the students and the instructor as well. Another strategy is case-based learning. It involves um, like applying theory to practice by discussing realistic and relevant scenarios. Case-based learning could be incorporated into the lecture. So it could be used in the lecture as a small activity, 10 to 15 minutes, or it could be also implemented as independent classes of like one hour, two hours. So you can control the complexity of um, case-based learning. But the most important thing here is, and this is strategy is that students are exposed to knowledge-based content first. Then you use the case-based learning for application of knowledge. So um, in the case-based learning, students encounter real-world uh, real context that expose them to viewpoints from multiple sources. This is really um, useful strategy, especially for pharmacy students. Now, um, let's move on to a more complex active learning strategy, problem-based learning. Problem-based learning is implemented in small group setting, for example, 12 students per facilitator, in the problem-based learning, students use triggers from the problem case or scenario to define their own learning objectives. Subsequently, they do independent self-directed study before returning to the group to discuss and refine their acquired knowledge. 
problem-based learning is not about problem, problem solving, but it uses appropriate problems to increase knowledge and understanding. Group learning facilitates not only the acquisition of knowledge, but also other desirable attributes such as communication skills, teamwork, problem solving, independent um, responsibility for learning, sharing information and respecting others. So when you decide to implement problem-based learning in your course, then there are some practical recommendations for successful implementation of the problem-based learning. Firstly, choose a central idea that's usually um, taught in a given course, for example, acute coronary symptoms. Then think of, of a problem that's usually assigned to students to help them to learn the concept, for example, um, case studies. Then you need to list the learning objectives that the students should meet uh, when, they when they work through the problem. Think of a real um, word context for, for the concept under consideration. For example, bring a case study from hospital placement, or you can even use um, already existing case studies. And also develop a storytelling aspect to the problem, um, or, or you can always, or, or as, I said, as I said earlier, you can always adapt an already developed case. So um, another important point to consider is the, the problem uh, needs to be introduced in stages and your role in the, in the contact time is as facilitator to prompt the students and not to provide correct answers. Here is an example of um, problem-based learning class implemented in the master program um, in clinical pharmacy at UCL. So for problem-based learning classes, each topic is delivered in three, in three sessions. For example, if we, uh, um, if we have like acute coronary symptoms as one topic, for the problem-based learning class, student will attend three sessions. So the first session is two hours long and it takes place in the morning. And the purpose of this session is for brainstorming and discussion. And, this, um, and the second session is around four hours and it usually takes, takes place after the morning session, so on the same day. And this is a student-led session. And then students are given a deadline to, sub to submit a, a written report and a reflection sheet. And the following week, students get an hour-long um, feedback session with their tutor. I will go through these sessions in detail in a minute. Okay, so, so what's happened in each session? So in, in the first session, the brainstorming and discussion, students are divided into small groups of five to eight students each. And each facilitator is responsible for facilitating two groups in a separate classroom. For each group, students have to choose a scribe who is responsible for keeping the of official notes and prepare the assigned report for their group. 
and also a chair who, uh, who, who lead the group. And these positions, uh, scribe and chairs, need to be rota rotated each session. So um, student will not depend on only one particular student. They need to rotate rules. In the, brain, in, in the brainstorming session and brainstorming and discussion session, which is two hours long, um, students are not allowed to use any resources. They are not allowed to, to um, access the internet or use text box or their mobile phones. And they need to reflect on their process in the previous problem-based learning classes. So they, knew, they need to reflect on what worked well for them in the last time and what didn't work well for them. And also what they would do differently in this session. So what happens in this session? Students are given a case study and work on it together and come up with a prioritized problem list or um, a learning plan. Also, there is um, a task given at the end of the case study, uh, which needs to be um, submitted in a written format. For example, uh, an example of the tasks that are usually given in uh, problem-based learning classes, um, like develop a pharmaceutical care plan for a patient who had acute coronary symptoms and underwent coronary artery bypass grafting surgery and who has um, a number of comorbidities. All right, so after the two hour brainstorming and discussion session, the, there is the student -led, led session, which is usually four hours long. Uh, so in this session, Students are free to access any resources. They need to meet their learning objectives and complete the, the written report. So it's not like they are staying in, in a classroom and doing that. They are free to use the, the library and free to use other learning um, spaces. So it's up to them really. So um, Students are not expected to work on the problem-based learning case after the student-led session, but perhaps only for word processing the report. So students need to understand that they need to finish the work and complete the work um, during the student-led session. So after that, students submit their written report and a reflection sheet to their tutor. And the following week, they have a one hour feedback session with their tutor um, about the case study and also the assigned task. So they have like larger group discussion to uh, discuss the case study and clarify any misconceptions and fill any gap in their understanding. All right, now um, let's move on to the final part of this webinar, the flipped classroom. It might seem odd to discuss the flipped classroom in this webinar because it's about active learning, but this teaching strategy has been um, a hot topic in international conferences and, and many in institutions worldwide, especially in the Western world, started introducing this method of teaching. So I thought it's, um, it's really worthwhile to have it here and discuss it with you guys. The flipped classroom is a hybrid approach to learning using technology to move the flipped, to, to move the classroom lecture into homework status and using face-to-face -face classroom time for interactive learning. In the flipped classroom, instructional, instructional resources are provided for students to use outside of class time. And the class time is freed up for more engaging learning activities facilitated by the lecturer. So instead of 
turning up to the lecture and presenting your content to the students who are sitting there passively and may or may not be listening. You are recording your lecture. You upload your materials online, let's say on a virtual learning environment, let's say Blackboard or Moodle, and then you create other activities, let's say online, online quiz, and then you use the session time, the one hour, for interactive learning, for interactive activities. The flipped classroom provides opportunities for self-paced learning, where students can go through the recorded lecture in their own time, at their own pace. This can never happen in the traditional lecture. Students can't pause the lecturer and they can't stop the lecturer and pause the lecture. Um, another benefit is that the flipped classroom is engaging when we compare that to the traditional lecture. In the flipped classroom, the contact time is freed up for interactive learning, while in the traditional lecture, the contact time is used for presenting the content to students. In addition, um, the flipped classroom encourages um, a deeper approach to learning. Um, comparing to the traditional lecture, students attend the lecture, take notes, memorize the recorded notes, and then aim for passing exam or achieving the highest grades. So this is the surface and strategic approach to learning, but the flipped classroom uh, teaching method promotes a deeper approach to learning. So it's also important to consider that the flipped classroom is not without drawbacks and challenges. Implementing the flipped classroom can increase the workload on both students and teaching staff because students are required to complete an independent learning and, and this can be overwhelming, right? Especially in the presence of other course commitments. Similarly, teaching staff are expected to create learning, learning activities for both phases of the, the flipped classroom for the pre-work and, and also for the scheduled session time. In addition, um, implementing the flipped classroom um, is more expensive than the traditional lecture and this might require support from IT staff and also from, from experts in teaching and learning. And also in the flipped classroom, in order to be implemented, you have, you have to have like recording facilities, and editing so software if you would like to edit your, your lecture, your online lecture, and also a virtual um, learning platform like Blackboard or Moodle if you would like to put up the learning activities online for students. And, and also equally important, academic staff might require professional development opportunities to assist them in understand the pedagogical concepts and therefore effective design and implementation of the flipped classroom because the flipped classroom needs um, careful design and with um, careful sequencing of the learning activities. So the out of class activities needs to target lower levels of Bloom's taxonomy like memorizing and understanding and then you might have the bridging activities, the online quiz that target application of knowledge. And then the, the, the in-class learning activities need to be um, designed to target higher level of Bloom's taxonomy, like application of knowledge and also um, um, analyzing. Okay, now um, let me give you an example of a flipped classroom that I designed for the final year um, for the final year undergraduate pharmacy students at UCL. 
the topic was management of rheumatoid arthritis. For, for the pre-class activities, I recorded my online lecture and I edited the lecture using a software called Camtasia. So I eliminated noises and also I cut the pauses, so I made it um, suitable for, for students. I made it high quality. I also provided text-based re learning ma uh, reading materials, so to give students flexibility on how they would like to prepare for the class. Because student, students have different preferences. Some students like to listen to online lectures, other students prefer to do uh, the reading themselves. So just to accommodate the, the, their preferences, um, I, included, um, I included two different types of learning resources. I also created an online interactive formative quiz so students can reinforce their learning and assess their understanding of the offloaded content. I uploaded all the learning materials on Moodle or some institution use blackboards anyway. <laughs> so the learning materials was upload, uh, uploaded on Moodle five days before the scheduled session time. I asked the students to complete the pre-work by viewing either viewing the online lecture or completing the reading materials. And also I advised them to complete the online quiz to reinforce their learning and assess their understanding. So I mentioned to them that it is important to complete the pre-work as we are going to go through case studies during the contact time. So, so the scheduled session time was one hour long. And for the first 10 minutes, I provided a, a brief recap about the online lecture. And I, I, I also asked the students if, they, if, any, if any student has any questions or anything that needs clarification. So like the, 10, the first 10 minutes of the contact time was used as bridging activities, questions and um, asking questions, answering questions, asking and answering, and also uh, clarifying any misconceptions in understanding. So uh, the remaining 50 minutes was spent on discussing case studies on a rheumatoid arthritis patient. Students worked in small groups of three to four in each group and I was rotating around the groups, assessing students um, and the group performance and, and monitoring the progress and also if anyone has any questions to ask. So here there are some practical recommendations for successful implementation of the flipped classroom. So when implementing the flipped classroom, it's important to provide sufficient time for students to complete the pre-class independent learning. And also ensure they are reminded about the assigned pre-work. So it's good practice to allow like five to seven days between the assignment of the pre-work and the contact time. And also provide students with guidance on pre-class preparation so they are clear about what they need to know or what they have to do during the scheduled session time. Also provide the learning materials to students in various formats, including recorded lectures, text-based read reading materials, and lecture notes. So this is to uh, satisfy preferences in students' learning styles. In addition, ensure that the, the reading materials are provided to students in printable format because not all students like to read from the computer. They need to have it in a printed format, have physical notes in front of them. In addition, the recorded lectures need to be of high quality. 
learning materials need to be easily accessible by students. In my case, I used um, Moodle and also provide the students with a reasonable amount of offloaded content. Um, in, 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 in our example, the, the length of the recorded lecture was around 35 minutes because when you have the, the lecture recorded, it's shorter than when you have it in, in contact, in face-to-face, -face because when you have the face-to-face -face lecture, it might be longer because you have that interaction, but when you are recording, it could be in, if of a shorter uh, dura duration, even if it's the same um, amount of information. Also, you need to explain to students the value of flipping the traditional lectures and also enable them to, to, to see the value themselves by planning in-class learning activities that target higher order thinking. Because when you are introducing a new teaching method, it's highly likely that students will resist. They will ask themselves why, and they will ask you why you are um, flipping, why you are using the, this method, why you are not using the traditional lectures. Because when you are used to something um, comfortable and suddenly this approach changes, it could be really frustrating for, stu for students. So you need to explain to them the value of flipping the traditional lectures. In addition, the flipped active sessions need to be delivered in a classroom that facilitates active learning. And I would strongly advise you to avoid the traditional tired lecture theater because in our implementation, it was found to be a barrier for student-student and student-teacher interaction. So what I mean by the tired lecture theater, the one that has different levels, we found it really difficult to move around the groups and monitor both group and um, student progress. And your role, your role in the contact time will be facilitator. So just to, to move around the groups and monitor both individual and group work. It is also advisable to plan the in-class learning activities that fit with the class size and the available session time in addition, make sure that the designed activities allow for group work. So it's going to be really tricky in choosing what active learning strategies to be used. It depends on the class size. If you have larger class size, it's going to be really difficult to use more complex strategies, but simple strategies are um, feasible. Also, ensure that there is a fit between the flipped approach and the topic content and the learning outcomes. Let me give you an example. Let's say if you, have, if you are teaching pharmacology and therapeutics, I think the flipped, the flipped approach will be more appropriate for teaching therapeutics than pharmacology because pharmacology is more, uh, more focusing on knowledge, uh, on um, delivering facts and knowledge. But therapeutics, the intended learning outcomes might be of um, higher level, maybe um, application, analyzing, and creating. So equally important, you need to integrate all pre-class and in-class activities and explain to students that they need to complete both phases to achieve the intended learning outcomes of the flipped class. So what is more, you need to provide an opportunity for students to reinforce their learning and to assess their understanding of the offloaded content. In my case, I created a formative online quiz. It's also advisable to provide opportunities during the contact time for students to ask you questions and clarify concepts from the offloaded content. In that case, you will bridge the gap between the knowledge-based content and the active learning um, exercises. Also provide a really brief recap or a very short summary about the offloaded content, but, so, but 
don't reteach the content again to help those who do not complete the preparation because doing so you will teach students to be responsible for their own learning and um, also build their build their self-study skills finally ensure that the learning activities are sequenced in terms of cognitive complexity as i mentioned before so the pre the pre-work need to target lower levels of Bloom's taxonomy and the in-class activities might target higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy like application and analyzing and creating. Some final notes and key messages. So when you decide to use um, active learning methods and strategies, firstly, I would strongly advise you to specify your intended learning outcomes and also determine the level of students' experience. Are they experienced in the content or not? Are they experienced with the non-traditional teaching methods and approaches or not? And also determine your personal style. Are you comfortable with running like um, teaching sessions with high interaction? Are you comfortable enough with managing larger groups? And also learn about basic concepts of teaching and learning um, and take professional development opp opportunities in teaching and learning. Final advice, start small. Student will resist, why? Because this is new to them. But again, always, always get their feedback improve your teaching practice and push back, you'll be successful. Thank you very much for your, for your attention and I will be happy to welcome any questions. Thank you, Dr. Amuna. Thank you. Very good information, a very informative talk today. Thanks. Uh, we had only a brief idea about this, but we got a, a lot of information today. Oh, I'm session. glad to hear that. <laughs> Thank you so much for your detailed uh, discussion today. Thanks. Um, I would like to welcome the questions from our participants. And there is an icon Q and A. Uh, just a yeah. type your question there. Already we have a question there. I think someone has asked that the name is not mentioned there. Yeah. Yeah, you can answer so, live, or you can mm -hmm. answer by text. It's a text by means you have to type. Okay. Uh, you can answer live by mic. That will be better, I think. It will be easy for you. Yeah. Uh, oh, just thank click you. the answer live and then you go for that. Okay. So, thank you, Dr. Noah. Um, I've got a question here from Anonymous. And the question is, do you think what we need to do in a flipped classroom session will be in somehow like problem-based learning? Yeah, just to click answer live and then you go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So you would like to be, yeah. Um, okay, so my, my, I understand that you are asking about what we do in flipped classroom. Do you mean the practical recommendations are applicable to problem-based learning? Do you think what we will do in flipped classroom? Uh, can you please clarify your question? Oh, thank you, Vipin. Um, okay, so you are asking um, how to encourage students to participate in active learning methods. So this is go back. So this is this discussion is around student experience. Yeah, um, if the students have never been exposed to active learning methods before, they will resist. And they might not have the basic skills and competence to participate in, in active learning classes. So this, is, this will be really new to them and comfortable and they might resist. So what I would like advise you to do is to start small, start with small activity. You can still 
teach using the traditional lecture, but start and incorporate like small tasks, small active learning um, approaches. And then students will gradually adapt and then they will gradually accept that because they will see the benefits themselves. And even though they might see it after they graduate, not during the course. So this really, it needs patient. It needs patience from the educator and, and also from, from the students. So you need to push back. Okay, so I have another question here. Um, how effective flipped classes compared to the conven conventional? Uh, so the recent evidence suggests that the flipped classroom is superior to the traditional lecture in building student competence and skills development. And it's also, um, it promotes self-study skills, which are, and also teamwork and all the generic skills that are um, necessary for, let's say, um, pharmacy graduates, because pharmacy graduates need to demonstrate a range of pharmacy related skills and also transferable skills like teamwork, self-study, ethics, um, communication, negotiation. So the flipped classroom is really effective, but as I mentioned, it's not without limitation. So you can't go ambitious and flip all the traditional lectures. You need to go small. You need to flip like few, few classes. And because in that case, in, in, in doing so, you will, you will be having a balance. You can't get rid of um, traditional lectures. It's, um, it's cheaper. And the, as I mentioned, the flipped classroom is, is really expensive and it takes effort and it takes time from both students and the um, educators to implement. Okay, let me see. Um, yeah, I have, I answered you. Uh, excuse me, for interruption. Sorry. Yeah, uh, just you click the answer live and then that will be uh, counted, I think so. so okay. Answered, yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's see. Um, we have another question here. Um, I would like to ask about examples for in-class activities for large number of students, 25 to 30 students. So for, for large class size between 25 to 30 students, it's advisable to use um, the simple tasks of active learning because as I mentioned, problem-based learning need to be implemented in a small classroom environment. But when you have larger classes, you can use the one minute paper, the muddiest point, the share, think share pair activity and also case studies um another question here would you kindly be be able to provide us with problem-based learning materials resources specially designed for pharmacy students so um yeah, so you are asking about um, the possibility of whether or not I'm able to provide problem-based materials. Um, unfortunately, I, because these are confidential and those are um, designed specifically for UCL, but um, what I can do is to share how the problem-based learning at UCL was um, designed and structured, so, and how the problem-based classes are run. Okay, so another question here. So this is a clarification of anonymous, the anonymous question. So the flipped classroom, is it like problem-based learning with previous preparation? Am I right? So the difference between problem-based learning and the flipped classroom in terms of preparation 
in the flipped, the flipped classroom, the students are provided with the learning materials and they need, they need to do the independent learning by themselves before they turn up to the, to the scheduled class time. But for the problem-based learning, I think it's, it doesn't need any prior preparation. Students come to the problem-based learning class. They come to the brainstorming class and prepare. They don't need to do any preparation. So um, another question here, what are the common difficulties, um, challenges we face while conducting flipped classroom? So when conducting the flipped classroom, uh, as I mentioned, it's not without any challenges. So for, for students and for the faculty members, for the faculty members, they need to understand the basic concepts of teaching and learning. So they, they need to understand the different levels of um, learning development. As I mentioned, the, in, on using the Bloom's taxonomy, we have different levels of learning, of describing learning behaviors. So, um, and also for the flipped classroom, you need to sequence the learning activities for the pre-class and the in-class so I think what most faculty members will face is the extra workload on them because they need to prepare learning activities for both phases. So there will be increase in the workload. But again, if you have the materials, you can use them for, for the next year and the following year when you update them. But it's really worth using uh, when you see the benefits that it brings to students we need to shift our thinking from being like traditional teachers just like um turning up to the class and um, giving students st facts and knowledge so we need to put more effort it's not impossible but it takes time and it's worth it Okay, another question here. I think one of the main problems is our school, I am talking about pharmacy school here, is that, okay, is that the time will not be enough to cover the subject using various techniques of active learning? What's, our, what's your suggestions? Okay, so oh, thank you for your questions. You, you are concerned about um, covering less content, right? Um, yeah, this is the problem. Um, but the, the suggestion here is to ask students to do more like independent learning. Here at UCL, students have more self-directed study. So there are like particular topics that, that, that they need to cover on themselves independently. And also, I think in order to balance, you can still deliver the traditional lecture, but you can always implement like small tasks. I'm not saying that you need to totally change your traditional lecture, but try and incorporate and um, add some elements of interactivity in your lecture, even if it's small. Another question saying, can we make flipped classroom of good quality by adding videos or graphics and how? Sorry, um, can you clarify your question? Mr. Arshad is saying, yes. There is one more question that's not answered. It was asked by the Prof. Khalid. Oh, sorry, I skipped. <laughs> uh, by, sorry, sorry, was asked by Arwa? Yeah, this is okay. the calculations in pharmacokinetics. 
Oh, sorry, I missed that because it keeps going up. Yes, yes. Automatically, so uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Arwa. <laughs> It's not so, an issue. <laughs> yeah. So your question is, what is the type of active learning method that can be used in the courses that contain calculations like pharmacokinetics? I think this is a really good question um, because in, in, in kinetics, it involves lots of calculations. So in, in that case, I would recommend using like simple tasks like case studies or flipped classroom. But the only issue with the flipped classroom is the self-study. If it's introductory course, students will resist. So it would be advisable to start small and maybe ask students to watch a small, short video and then come to the class for traditional lecture and case studies and discussions. Um, yeah, so okay. Okay, so um what do you suggest the percentage of conventional teaching and flipped classroom? So um I think there is no right or wrong answer. So the most important thing is to keep a balance. Because as I mentioned, the flipped classroom increases the workload for both students and, and teaching staff. So from my focus groups, students suggested introducing the flipped classroom to be delivered once a week because they will have other teaching, other course commitments like problem-based learning, practical workshops, simulations. So it depends on the student workload really okay another question here what are the recommended assessment methods for active learning techniques so the recommended assessment methods for active learning techniques this really depends on the intended learning outcomes and if you go back to the miller's triangle or the miller's pyramid you can decide on what level of, of understanding you would like to assess. So each level corresponds with particular assessment methods. Let's say if you are assessing skills in pharmacy students, OSCEs will be appropriate. But if you are assessing knowledge acquisition, it will be um, multiple choice questions. And if you are assessing performance, it will be observing the trainee. Okay, so here, um, my question, do you think is, is it better to be, to be achieved by individual lecturer or better to be a program strategy as part of the specification? Uh, sorry, sorry. Can you can you clarify your question about is it better to be achieved by individual lecturer or better to be a program strategy as part of the specification? Um, can I interfere here, Dukura? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think uh, he mentioning I don't know he or she. <laughs> there is no name for from them. Yeah. Uh, actually, the intention of the question is that whether the individual lecturer he can decide or that particular strategy has to follow in the particular specification itself okay itself uh, yeah uh, thanks his question or his or her question i think yeah thanks dr noah yeah. so it's about the intended learning outcomes of the program right and the intended learning outcomes of the lecture am yeah. i correct yeah you are right you are right so it's it's really important to work with the program designers yeah definitely so when you have the yeah depends on the intention and intended learning outcomes uh, when you decide the course learning outcome then mm -hmm. that, that stage itself we have to decide it what is a, a teaching strategy and assessment method we are going to use yeah so, yeah i agree yeah it, it should be measurable you know then only mm. we can 
go with that strategy otherwise we cannot yeah oh thanks dr no yeah welcome uh, the another question i think we have already replied mhm mm okay so can skip that one i will okay. reply to him. i will reply to him okay so let's see here um i think one of the main problems in our school no, no that okay. has been already replied so we we gave the answer okay <laughs> as i actually he is our colleague from najran <laughs> okay <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's good. I welcome him and uh, and uh, thanks for his participation. Thank you for attending. Matar, Matar Mahanishi. Another question saying, can we use flipped classroom for an assessment purpose, such as summative or formative? What is your thought? So using flipped classroom for an assessment purpose. Flipped classroom is not an assessment tool. It is for, it is a teaching tool. But depending on the intended learning outcomes, you choose your assessment tool, if that's clear. I don't know if I misunderstood your question or not. So can you please send us this valuable presentation by email? Yeah, sure. I, I can. Yeah, I can do that. I will contact the host and will send the lecture slides to you all. Another question. In your experience in UCL, how was the student feedback session with the mentor for problem-based learning? Were they too receptive? Actually, I worked as facilitator for the problem-based learning, and also I was a student in a problem-based learning. So in 2012, when I did my master's, it was, so the first problem-based learning was a shock to me. Like the first class was like, it's something not familiar. It's, it wasn't comfortable, but they explained to us the, how it works. So everything was clear to us. And what do we need to do in the problem-based learning classes? So the first class was uncomfortable. The second one was okay. The third was familiar and we really appreciated. So we resisted at, at first. And I think it's, it's the same for most students. Um, here we have, what is the program you will suggest us to record high quality audio lectures? So for recording, I used recording facilities at UCL with using a mic. And for editing, I used Camtasia. And Camtasia is an editing software and it can eliminate any noises from the um, recorded lecture. And if you want to cut any like pauses, any long pauses and make it make your um, recorded lecture tidy. Um, so, and even you can record your own live lecture if you are planning to implement the, the flipped classroom, let's say next year. This is another possibility. And one more thing I would like to add here, the Kura. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For Camtasia, we have Tegrity also, we can use. Okay, so it has the f similar functions to Camtasia. But Camtasia is better than, uh, but Tegrity also we can try. Okay, that's good. Uh, I mean now with, with the advancement, more, sorry. Camtasia has more, uh, more advancements, yes. Hmm. I mean with advancement in technology, even you can record using mobile phones, so it's no problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, could you please provide some useful web resources to get an idea about flipped classroom if you have? So about um, providing, resources about the flipped classroom. Yeah, I can do that. Um, I will contact the host and um, they will get the information to you. So do you think we need um, students with high GPA to implement such way of teaching problem-based learning? So do you mean that the, the, the problem-based learning will be successful with students with high GPA. Uh, in my opinion, 
high, the GPA does not reflect students' skills. Students could be either experienced, like have an experience with the problem-based learning, or even, or they might be inexperienced with the problem-based learning. So it's, it's really a matter of introducing students to the concept of the problem-based learning, make that clear to them, and set a clear, a clear expectations and about being organized. And students will resist, but then they, they will accept that. So can we give more model problem-based learning to make the students familiar? What would you suggest? Uh, sorry, Dr. Nuh, can you help me with this question here? Uh, yes, uh, she's asking that uh, whether she can get more models. Any examples, I, I think so. She okay. Yeah. That is her question. Sorry. Yeah, she needs more. Can we give more models? Any? She need more examples. I say examples or case scenarios to make the students familiar. Yes, we can give more. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes, I can share the uh, presentation slides with you. Um, is the flipped classroom in the flipped classroom? How can I evaluate the students' achievement in the class grading process? So the flipped classroom is a teaching strategy, is not an assessment strategy, unless you would like to assess a student performance in the class. But what we do here in the UK, we don't assess student performance formally, like formative assessment in the classroom, but they have like separate assessment tools, assessment um, strategies. So the flipped classroom is only for teaching, for delivering the teaching and building their skills and um, competence. Could you please clarify the assessment technique for flipped classroom? It's again, it depends on your intended learning outcomes because in the flipped classroom, you can use any active learning strategies. So flip the classroom is, is about flipping the traditional lecture. And in the contact time, you are the one who, um, who decide on what active learning um, activities to include in the contact time. And this is again, depends on the learning outcomes. Okay, so um, flipped classrooms are dependent on student participation. Unfortunately, there is no way to guarantee students will cooperate with the flipped model. Are there ways to increase students' cooperation? So it's about explaining to students the value of flipping the flipped classroom. And when they, when they see the value themselves, they will cooperate. So you need to to explain to them that they need to complete the pre-work in able to be successful. And I think students will fail first and then they, they will master it like in the following years. It's like OSCEs because here, um, I've been working with OSCEs and for the first years, students, the, the, the pass rate for OSCEs for the first year is really low, but for the second year is higher and then for the third and fourth year it's even higher. Well, another question, what is the preferred level to start the flipped classroom sessions? So this is about student experience, right? So when starting the flipped classroom sessions, because when it's something new to students, I would strongly advise you to start small. For example, you assign a short video to students and then the contact time will be both for sharing um, the content and also for discussion. 
and it's really simple tasks, simple active learning tasks. Is your last slide with respect to key decision? You, you said about personal style. What would be most appropriate style for students with no experience in active learning methods? Okay, so about the key messages, I explained like um, a number of factors that needs to be considered when choosing the active learning methods. So you need to consider your personal style. I mean, if you as an educator, not comfortable with unstructured active learning strategies and um, managing larger, like a larger group, like 50, to 70 students, I would say 50 students. So using problem-based learning in a large class setting is not appropriate or using, uh, I wouldn't say problem-based learning, I would say case-based learning in a large class room setting is not appropriate, but you can use the think, share, pair, pair, share activity, which is less complex than the, the, the um, case-based learning. So for students that has no experience with active learning methods, again, you can use simple tasks like one minute paper, group discussion, and also um, like case-based learning uh, of small duration. Okay, here another question. For active learning methods, what are the links? we can go through the internet. So there is a really useful resource I used for this presentation, um, not for all, but for most of it. And it summarizes and in a table, all the active learning methods. I can't say all, but most like some active learning methods that can be used. So I will share that with you through the host. That's no problem. What is the difference between research, lab-based project, and, okay, so what's the difference between research, lab-based project? I think he means the problem-based learning. Yeah, project-based learning. Project-based, I think it is a problem-based learning. Yeah. It's a bracket he mentioned to PBL. I think uh, you want to ask the difference between the lab-based problem learning and uh, in classroom, I think, research lab. Okay, classroom. yeah. So what do you think, Dr. Noor? Because I'm not really expert in lab-based teaching. Um, I'm, I'm more like pharmacy practice and clinical um, pharmacy. Um, so, yeah, sorry. I... Me too, mm. I, even, I cannot help you in this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I I can't clarify the problem-based learning, but I'm not really That's familiar. He, he used the terminology, I think, that uh, project-based learning and lab-based research, lab-based. I think. Mm. I don't worry. I know. I know the <laughs> faculty member. I will clarify you personally. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks, Doctor No. Okay. That's, yeah. Okay. So. Um, could you please give us some examples of the assessment strategies used in your university? So at UCL, we have um, a number of assessment strategies um, and mainly we have the OSCEs for assessing both skills and knowledge. And there are the written exam multiple choice questions and other written assessment. And also for practical labs, they have their own assessment methods, which I'm not familiar with because I am not lab-based. I, I worked in pharmacy practice department. Project-based learning. Okay, will you list some active learning methods which will be useful for a clinical pharmacy. I think the same uh, staff has asked one more question. It's about project-based learning, he clarified. Okay, it's about project-based learning. Mini, these are mini projects like that, he's asking. 
Yeah, sorry, I'm I'm not I'm not familiar with the project based learning. Okay. Okay, so can we use um jigsaw strategy in flipped classroom sessions? Yeah, I think yeah, I think it's it's possible because because in the flipped classroom in the flipped classroom you can use any activity but in the flipped classroom really you need to have the learning activities done during the contact time but i'm not sure if the jigsaw strategy can be um uh, let me work it out in my head so the jigsaw strategy is you get uh yeah i think yeah i think it's possible it could be possible So in your opinion first, you should, you should train staff members to do their role perfectly as a tutor with problem-based learning. So about training staff members, if there are opportunities, it will be really good. If there are no opportunities for staff members, it would be advisable to do like, you can do your own search and you can I don't know, in my case, um, I learn a lot about um, active learning methods independently. So, um, and also I try to attend conferences about teaching and learning and um, doing like diplomas and workshops about teaching and learning. You can find many opportunities online and also on YouTube. So if you don't find th those opportunities at your own institution, you can always go and search the, the web and find more opportunities. Okay, thank you, Arshad Hussain, for clarifying the difference between active, um, lab-based active learning and active learning. Another question, how can we apply problem-based learning in larger groups of students? more than 20 students per group. Actually, problem-based learning needs to be applied in small classroom setting. So if you have 20 students per group, um, I, don't, I don't think that would be practical, practical because um, I don't know, there is no right or wrong answer for the number of people, but what do you think, Dr. Noor? Yeah, I think uh, well, it's a huge number, 20 students per group is a huge number. Yeah, how would the student manage the group tasks mm, and stuff? To manage the group. So I think it needs to be smaller, like if you have 20 students, you can divide them into two groups. Yeah, we need more faculty members to engage those step up groups. Or mm. we can do, uh, um, this, this is a suggestion. Uh, Dr. Basil is from uh, College of Pharmacy from Najran University. He was our previous okay. <laughs> uh, He's with Matra Al Mahanashi. I'm so very happy to see these people. Uh, oh, yeah, it's my privilege. Our, yeah. month, uh, our uh, webinar. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh thanks for, for giving me the opportunity. It's really valuable. Yeah. They're our old colleagues. So <laughs> nice to meet them <laughs> in the webinar. <laughs> um, um, Regarding the group for uh, more than 20 students in a group, I think we yeah. can divide it into different sections. You know, they are, if they are in one section, we mm -hmm. can create a different section. That means Shoba. Different Shoba we can create. Mm -hmm. By that way, we can divide the students into multiple groups, small groups. That will help us. Yeah, and even if you have shortage in staff, in teaching staff, you can benefit from other staff members like what you call Mu'id. Yeah. With, yeah. To engage those classrooms, at least we need um, more faculty members in that particular section. So if you have enough faculty members, we can divide them into different shoba. Yeah. So then can engage. Even with the same faculty, we can give him another time to engage yeah. the particular shoba. So that will be easy for us. Yeah, that's... More than 20 students if you want to convert into group. That we can yeah, that's correct. And even for, for the problem-based learning, if you are the tutor for this particular class, you are not expected to attend the brainstorming session. So these sessions can be 
facilitated by other staff members like support staff because it really needs like um, managing the group and monitoring the group performance and you can provide them with tutor notes you can provide your support staff with tutor notes yes and they can help you to manage that large yes, yes. so Yeah, so um, let me see. If, okay, apart from the flipped classroom, is there any other effective teaching tools for active learning? Okay, so um, I will share with you that document that lists like a number, a range of active learning methods and lists also the recommendations for their implementations. Um, just looking, did I miss any question here? Yeah, I'm hoping that I answered all questions. Um, I think we we went yeah through them all. Yeah. I think uh, the last question you answered. I think from one plus two, answered okay. Yeah. Okay. That's that's great. Yes, we have done almost uh, thirty-seven questions. That's that's great. <laughs> that's a good uh, good number of questions we have answered. <laughs> <laughs> so, can we conclude, uh, the Torah? Uh, yes. Um. So, there's. Does anyone have any other questions before we conclude? Could it be in, yeah? There was a question asked in the chat. I think they missed it. Mm -hmm. To type in the question. It was from the Quran Haba Salim. Uh, yeah. Could you give us some examples of the assessment strategies used in your university? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, regarding the assessment strategies used in our university. So, in the pharmacy practice department, which covers the clinical pharmacy, um, the main assessment strategy is OSCEs, which is like practical face-to-face, -face, um, which is practical assessment. And like a typical OSCEs has six stations. Two of them are patient facing and four stations are not patient facing. So it includes calculations, like assessing prescriptions and other activities. So this is the OSCEs. And this is, this is the, the, the commonly used assessment tool. Thank you, Doctor, for the answer given to Dr. Heba. Thanks, you. thanks. Yeah? yeah. Okay, so is that could it be injected in a traditional school of medicine or only in? Uh, sorry, Dr. Noor, can you clarify that question? Be oh, I, I read the question before. I uh, a little bit confused. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm confused to say. Typo error, I think, in that question, there's a typo error. Yeah. We, we can kindly request the, the participant to retype the question again. Hmm. Um, it's it's so the question saying could it be injected in traditional school of medicine or only in problem based learning? Yeah, it's a problem based learning. Yes, I think. But um, again, um, it, the question seems unclear to me. What does be injected in a traditional school of medicine mean? Someone asking whether this webinar is recorded or not. Yeah, I replied. Yeah, it's uh, recorded. We can, they can use it. They can read it. Okay, that's good. They can listen. Yeah, it is recorded. Does anyone have any questions before we conclude? No, we are waiting for this uh, Misaki Mai. Mm -hmm. Clarify the question again. I have asked okay. 
I asked the um, attendee to clarify the question, okay? Yeah, so um, do we need to standardize the new assessment methods before we implement it? What is the process to be followed? So, yeah, changing the assessment methods is really big task and it needs collaboration between the course designers and the teaching staff because they need to agree on what intended learning outcomes to be assessed. I don't know because here at UCL the curriculum is integrated and it's spiral. So the assessment methods, they don't like assess topic by topic, but they, they assess like skills and pharmacy related skills and knowledge. So I'm not sure how it works in your institution here. Um, I think you can interfere in this. Sorry. But can I clarify? Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, in this case, we want to standardize. Uh, I think he's asking about do we need to standardize the new assessment methods before we implement it? Mm -hmm. What is the process to be followed? Um, definitely, we are going to measure the, any of the five domains. Yeah. So, um, from that five domains, what is the assessment method we are going to do? Is the, whether it is uh, measurable or what is the key performance indicator we are going to follow there? It depends on that. After that, only we can go for the standard. We have to standardize or not. So, before that, we should know what are the key performance indicator or benchmarking we have for that particular domain. And then whether it is measurable or not, that, that assessment method we can measure or not in particular domain. That has to be confirmed first. Then we can standardize it. That has to be discussed in consecutive meetings in, uh, because we now we started to write our curriculum. So we are the course designers and we are the instructors also. So we play both the dual role. So it's not a big deal for us because we are going to play the dual role. So we can know, we can measure also. We can standardize by ourselves. I hope I answered the question. Okay. Um, Dr. Noor, is there anything that we need to answer before um, we conclude? Asking, I'm waiting for this question. This was asking about the that is injected one something they want to ask about a PBL. We did not clarify okay. that question, so I'm waiting for that. I think almost we have done. I think okay. Can, yeah, I think we can conclude. That, okay, that that's no problem. Um, thank you so much, Dutura, for your uh, long presentation today. I think we took <laughs> almost two hours from you, more than that, and <laughs> exactly two hours. It's my <laughs> it's pleasure. Remaining. It's four minutes remaining <laughs> to complete two hours. It's a very good interactive session, and um, so it was our first experience to have a webinar. Mm -hmm this platform and I thank uh, the host uh, Dr. Riyadh, uh, he is the one who made it successful today. I thank him and for the learning deanship also for facilitating all this technical support. And thank you so much Dr. Ramona for giving us the very good informative lecture. And in this occasion, I used to thank, uh, like to thank our dean uh, to make us a, a good opportunity to have a very good interaction with the international speaker. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, no, Dr. Noor. Thank you very much for uh, Thanks. Uh, uh, such a nice webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. for your time. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, who have been involved. Thank and it's my time. pleasure. And thank you for the participants and especially um, my beloved guys from Najran, <laughs> Dr. Basil <laughs> and uh, Matharal Mahanashi. I remember those days, how we were in the campus. And this was very good, interest, uh, interesting period at that time. We were, we were very good. Um, we had a very good time at the time in the campus. Um, so I, I like to thank all the participants who gave their valuable time.
and who who made this session very good interactive from our colleagues and from other uh, participants from other region also so i thank you thank thank you all of you on behalf of our dean and from college of pharmacy and from the e learning range thank you so much for all the participants thank you